We're glad to be here. Uh, beautiful country, by the way. It's beautiful. All the mountains and the, and the hills and the trees uh, that are just changing colors. So we're down by the Jersey Shore, the one in New Jersey, not the one in Pennsylvania. I heard there's a Pennsylvania Jersey Shore here. That's kind of odd, but that's okay. Um, and uh, so my elevation in my house is elevation 20, you know what I mean? 20. So what, I was it here, 2,000, something like that here? So it's way different and love seeing all the mountains. Anyway, so we're really glad to be here. Uh, we thought it'd be really good for you guys, a little more comfortable to have a six foot something tall, bald guy from New Jersey preach, make you feel more comfortable. So that's why they invited me to come up here. Uh, anyway, as you guys know, Josh and his family are amazing. And our district, our state, our, our, myself, miss him greatly. But you guys got a really good one, didn't you? You got a really good one, for sure, for sure. And you guys are blessed, I'm sure. Um, so my name is Chris. My wife, Maranatha. I have two of my kids here. A couple more are at the dean's house. And then I have two more at home. So God has blessed us with seven wonderful kids. And uh, we're so glad to be here. So thank you for, for having us here. Yeah, for sure. Hey, I want to pray and then get into God's word. Is that okay with you? Yeah, let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this morning. God, I thank you uh, just for being here together to worship you, to remind ourselves of your goodness, your faithfulness, as we sang earlier. God, you are so good, and we are so thankful for all you've done in our lives. And God, we want to hear from you this morning. So Holy Spirit, come have your way with me, with your words that you want to speak. May it be you and not me. Get me out of the way. Lord, I thank you that we have hearts for you to plant your word in. And God, may it land on the good soil of our hearts to produce a crop 60, 100-fold. So have your way. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning, I want to talk about walking by faith. Walking by faith is the theme of the message, uh, but first I want to talk about the Titanic. We all know the story of the Titanic, right? This amazing ship that was built in England, going to sail over the Atlantic over here to, uh, to America, and uh, engineering was phenomenal for its time, and how long and how strong they built it. There's a lot of pride in what they built with that. Unsinkable, for sure. But then we know the story of... Uh, of, of, of this, with the person in the front dancing, you know, with the wind going in their hair. No, not that. Um, but we know the story of the, the iceberg hitting it and having the big gash in it, and it's filled with water and sinking. And their pride in what they built, they thought, oh, unsinkable, so they didn't have enough of the lifeboats or life preservers. And we know the story of thousands, thousands dying. And it's devastating, heartbreaking. The unsinkable ship sank, and all it took was just that one little breach well, I think about the climate that our country is in and things going on around us, situations in our lives that could be like an iceberg that can cause a gash in us and cause us to sink. You know, maybe you have lost a loved one close to you. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you have uh, a, a teen or a 20-something that's walked away from the Lord. Um... Maybe there's this strife within your family. You know, the climate in our country with the, the presidential election coming up, the politicians, how they talk with each other, the riots. I think about the whole COVID, the pandemic. Like, it has just been crazy, crazy times. And it's really easy to be overwhelmed by all these things to the point where we can sink. You know, if you're like me, but kind of take pride in myself. I'm strong, I'm smart, I have all these things. And often I think, hey, I can do this. But no, like, I can sink, we can sink. And so this morning I want to talk about how we can walk by faith and we don't have to sink in the despair that's all around us. I want to talk about a few, three ways of what we can see through God's word uh, in, in Matthew chapter 14 of someone who started walking by faith but then looked around, stumbled, fell, and sank. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 22. I'm going to read the section, and then we'll, we'll dive into it. So in verse 22, it says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside, by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, 
and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down on the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. There's that word again, immediately, right? Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. We see here uh, a story of walking by faith and looking around and sinking. That does not have to be us. We don't need to let the things of the world get us to have us sink. But it is possible that we can continue to walk by faith and stay afloat. And so the three things I want to talk about in order to do that is this first one is just to be available. And you'll notice I put in your handouts um, a little insert to fill in as you go. I know me, me with my ADD, I can, tend to kind of lose focus. So sometimes it helps me to keep focused. Um, sometimes I know people like to make it a, a little game so you can fill out the words before I say the words, before they pop up. Some might have already filled out already. Go for it. That's cool. No worries. <laughs> um, but yeah, just fill it out as you guys want. Put some notes in there to look at later on during the week to go back into God's word. God, what are you speaking to me today as well? I love having that kind of stuff in there. And so the first one is just be available. We need to be available um, to walk by faith. Jesus had the disciples get into the boat on purpose. He had them go knowing that there was a storm about to hit them in the boat, making them available. Hey, here you go. I'm going to put you in this situation. And why does God do stuff like that? Why does God put us in situations that are beyond and above us? Because he is always after our hearts. He's always trying to get inside of what's going on inside of us. You know, we come to faith in Christ. We believe in him as Lord and Savior. We come as we are. And that's a beautiful thing that Jesus accepts us that way. But his love doesn't end there. His love continues in us. And it continues to want to grow and to build that relationship with him. And so he's always after our hearts. Always after areas that are struggles, that are hurts. And so to be available, know that he does it because he is always after you and after your heart. He uses situations in our lives to expose areas that he's trying to work on. He uses those to shine that light on that. Being available also shows us that we need to be fully dependent upon God's power. We cannot be dependent upon us. We cannot be dependent upon what we think we know, how to handle a situation, and what we need to do. He's going to put us in places where it's going to be way over our head, and we recognize, I can't do this, but I need you, God. We need to be fully dependent upon God's power in our lives, not dependent upon what we think, what we know, what we've been through, our strength, our smarts, none of that, but dependent upon him, dependent upon his power. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul goes on to talk about strength. And he says, To keep me from, bekeeving, from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I'm not a fan of persecutions. Anybody out there? Fan of persecutions? No? Oh, surprising. <laughs> difficulties? Who wants some side of, side of difficulties on your plate there for your life? No. Insults? You could take those too. But Paul's saying he takes delight in these things because when he has these things come and hit him, he recognizes these are way above what I can handle. And when we get to the point and recognize that whatever situation that we are in is overwhelming, and we recognize that we can't do it, there's only one, only one place to look. That's to look up to God. 
Look up to his power in your life. We need to be fully dependent upon God's power and not upon our own. And so because God's after us, he's going to put us in positions that are awkward, put us in places that we don't like, that are stretching, so that we do not rest on and depend upon our power, but that we rest upon his power. For when we are weak, then we're strong. In ourselves, no. But strong in God. Strong in his power and his authority over our lives. If you truly want to be one who walks by faith, we need to stop depending upon ourselves and start depending upon God. When we acknowledge our weakness, we can fully start to look at the real source of our lives. And that real source is Jesus Christ. Amen? The next point is what we need to do to walk by faith is to be willing. So one is be available. Next one is to be willing. And to be willing is something that we need to have an attitude towards. And so if you want to show the, the, the uh, you know, hold on, pause on the video. Yeah, so there is a town in Portugal called Nazaré. Anybody familiar with Nazaré, Portugal? Anybody? I wasn't either until I started watching some of these amazing videos of these huge, huge waves. Nazaré has the world's largest waves that come through there. The way that the channel is under the ground, the swells come to a point and then they break. Over a hundred feet, the waves can get. The tallest wave that was uh, surfed was a hundred feet, and it was done in this place. So I want to show you this video to to check out these waves. This thing just goes on forever. That is a huge wave. <laughs> it's huge. All right, so when you guys look at that, who's saying, hey, let's go, I want to ride that? Anybody? Yeah, you want to ride? Yeah, yeah? Would you ride it? Like, when you look at that wave, it's like, what the? There's no way. And yet, people ride that. And so different people, different personalities look at situations are like, heck yeah, let's go, baby. We got this. Now, I have a personality that is very similar to that. So if you guys study different personality types, there's a lot of different things. Myers-Briggs, SDI, strength builders, strength finders. Uh, one of them is something that is called like, uh, just p- personalities, and there's four animals. There's a lion, a beaver, a golden retriever, and an otter. Anyway, the lion personality is one that takes charge, you know, king of the jungle type of a thing. They're CEOs, they're bosses, they do a great job getting people to accomplish a task that they have. Uh, an, uh, a beaver, think about them, how they build the dam, and maybe they've got to be neat and orderly. They're the ones that are really organized. Structure is good for them. They have a checklist, and they, they, write, they write their checklist, and they check them off as they go. Don't start another project until that one's done. Uh, the golden retriever, very loyal. Great behind-the-scenes people. They make the best friends. They're great listeners. They're caring. They're loving. And then there's the otter. The otter is the fun-loving, life of the party. Everything's got to be bigger and better. They have a list in their mind, and they don't ever finish any other thing on the list. And yet they go on to the next part. Okay? And so that is me. I am an otter of otters. Uh, I think the highest score is 40. I get 40. Like, that's just me. Uh, Very, very extroverted. People, uh, they energize me. And so that's just the life of the otter. And the otter says, hey, let's go. I might die, but let's go anyway. It's going to be fun. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. And so when you look at those waves, like there are people that say, hey, let's go. There's other people that are like, uh, no, thank you, as you slowly back up. Like that's not going to happen at all. I'll look at the waves from a distance, thank you. Uh, and so when we look at the story of Peter walking on the water in Matthew chapter 14, he had to have a little bit of otter in him, for sure. Because when he saw Jesus walking on the water, he's like, let's go. Jesus, is that you? Yeah, well then tell me to come. And so he just was like, okay, I'm doing this, for sure. But if I do my math correctly, he's one of what? 12 that are in the boat. So there's 11 chickens in the boat that are like, I'm not having anything to do with that at all. So Peter and the chickens, they wanted nothing to do with it. Nothing at all to do with it. Peter said, let's go when he saw that. Storm. 
wind, waves. Down by the Jersey Shore, uh, we have hurricanes that have come. Sandy came through. Uh, in the winter, we have nor'easters. And so I know what it's like seeing the ocean, seeing a big body of water with the wind coming. The waves get crazy. The, the rain, it's just, it's, it's insane. To think that somebody would say, hey, I can do what you're doing, God, takes a crazy personality to say, let's go. There was a willingness within him. For us to walk by faith, God is calling us to have a little bit of that let's go personality, mentality within us. Because we rest upon his power, not upon ours. Because we know the one who we're going to be walking toward, not in our strength. God is going to put us in situations that are going to be tough. But yet he's saying for us, hey, let's go. Let's go with him. Let's do this. We can do it. 1 Samuel chapter 17 talks about somebody else who had that kind of personality. And that's King David. And in 1 Samuel 17, it's the story of David versus Goliath. When I came in here, Pastor Kevin's like, oh, you know, you brought Goliath in here for this weekend because I'm, I'm a little bit tall. And so I'm like, hey, I'm preaching on Goliath a little bit this morning. So glad you mentioned that. And so David and Goliath, very familiar story with us. The Philistines want to fight the people of, of Israel, take their land over, get their crops and all that stuff. So their army is situated here. The Israelite army is here. They're getting ready for battle. Come to battle. All the soldiers ready to go. And then all of a sudden, out steps this giant, Goliath. He comes out and he says, hey, you guys are weak. I defy you. Your God is weak. I defy him. If any one of you want to come and fight me individually, if you beat me, then we will surrender to you and be your servants. But if I beat your warrior, then you will be our servants and we'll take over your land. And so this giant would come out and the army ready to go would see this giant come out and then they would cower back in fear. Fear of this huge giant and not one of them willing to step up and to fight against him, to defeat them so they could defeat the Philistines. Then all of a sudden comes this teenage boy, really. That's what David was. He was the youngest in the whole family, taking care of the lowly sheep. He comes and he hears the same thing that all the other soldiers heard. He sees the same thing that they see, yet there's something within him, his willingness to say, hey, let's go. How dare you, you uncircumcised Philistine? How dare you talk about my God like that? How dare you talk about my people like that? And so Saul, the king at that time, heard about what David was saying and called David to him. And he's, in, in verse 33, 1733, Saul replied, hey, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. And he's been a fighting man from his youth. 34, David said, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. See, David had this let's go mentality, because he had been building up his faith since he was even younger than this. Could imagine those nights watching the sheep up there just with a sling and some stones and kind of just whirling around and hitting a bigger rock maybe 10 feet or 20 feet away from him. I can imagine that maybe a bird was flying by. He's like, oh, I'm going to practice hitting that and he would hit the bird going by. could imagine that there were different things climbing up trees and he would try to hit that as well. You see, David didn't start by defeating a lion or a bear, but he gradually built his faith up. Before that, I'm sure it was a coyote or a wolf. Before that, probably a fox. Before that, probably a snake. And so he built up his faith to where a lion or a bear came, and he could handle that. And then when he sees this giant that's defying his God and his, and his brothers, he said, ah, God will take care of that like he took care of the lion and the bear. 
You see, faith is like a muscle. Faith is like a muscle. And the more that you use it, the stronger it gets. David was starting to exercise that muscle when he was younger. David, I'm sure through his life, saw the power of God come upon him or upon the situation that he was in. And it caused him to put more trust in God, more faith in God. See, the more you use your muscle, the stronger it gets. Faith is the same way. Conversely, when you don't use it, it gets weaker. I don't know if you guys, being a kid or whatever, broke a bone, but I broke a wrist. And uh, it was during the summertime, and so I had the cast on, a little sweaty in there, nasty in there. And uh, when they took it off, I could not believe the difference of my arm that had the cast on it that was taken off with the arm that had not had it on. It was like whitish, I guess from like being like the hot and sweaty in there. It like turned more white. And it was considerably smaller and much weaker. You see, when we don't use our muscles, atrophy kicks in. Our muscles start to deplete. And so I had to now work this back and lay it out in the sun by itself and not this arm to get it more like the color of this arm to make it look and feel and be the same as both arms. And the same thing happens with our faith when we do not put it in action. It becomes unrecognizable. Do people recognize that you have faith in the living God? Do people recognize that you have faith in the powerful, almighty God? Is it recognizable to them? Is your faith recognizable to those around you? Do they see it? Or were you like me and have that cast with the weak, different-looking arm? You see, faith is like a muscle. We have to put it in action. We have to work it. God loves us so much that he's going to put us in situations where he's going to cause us to activate our faith. We need to act our faith, activate our faith more and more and more. In order to be one that walks by faith, we need to be willing to step out and say, let's go. Let's do this. We need to be ones that look at the situation, even though it could be a crazy storm all around us, but we know the power of the one that, 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 we, that we have and that we see. We need to take faith-filled risks. We need to take faith-filled risks. You go to the next slide. The third thing to walk by faith is that we need to be watchful. We need to be watchful. And so uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. You see, those that walk by sight see what's going around, and then they sink, they stumble, they fall. But yet the one who walks by faith sees the very same thing, walks and doesn't stumble, walks by faith and thrives. We need to walk by faith and not by sight. It reminds me of a story in 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6 is about the prophet Elisha. And Elisha was a powerful man of God and uh, did powerful things for, for God and for, and for Israel. And there was another country, kind of like the Philistines, this is Aram, and they wanted to just take over the Israelites. And so um, they knew about Elisha, and they knew that this man would be in the way of what they wanted to do to take over Israel. And so the king of Aram sent his troops to go get Elisha. And so... Uh, I, I, I love waking up this morning and looking around. Beautiful mountains. Again, I call them mountains because 20 foot elevation, you know, where I'm at. These are mountains, uh, huge mountains, beautiful mountains. I look around and they're just surrounded, this whole place. We're in a little valley here, right? And so that is what happened back then. Imagine seeing armies all around wherever you looked. This is what happened when the army went to go get Elisha. And so we could pick up uh, in verse 13, 6 verse 13, 2 Kings 6 verse 13. And the king says, go and find out where Elisha is so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went there by night and they surrounded the city. So at night they surrounded the city all around. 
when the, verse 15, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots has surrounded the city. And he said, oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. And so I can just imagine, you know, waking up, sun comes up, you're stretching, ah, oh, what a great day this is going to be today. Rise and shine and give God the glory. He's probably singing that song in his heart, right? And he goes uh, to do his morning routine, some chores, sweeping up the, the, the front porch, going to get water from the little trough that's there, maybe throw some, some corn out for the chicken. Goes out there, ah, oh, what a beautiful day, looking at the sun, and, and what the heck is that all around? Not only does he see this army, but they're all focused right on him and his house, because they're there for his, his master. They're there for Elisha. And I can just imagine the servant being like, okay, backing up slowly. You can't see me. You can't see me. Get into the house and shutting the door right behind him because he is fearful for his life, as he should be. He is freaking out. And he goes in and he, and he, tells, he tells Elisha, what's going on? And I love Elisha's response. It sounds a lot like Jesus' response, what he did with Peter. It was a lot like Jesus' response that he would say to us. And Elisha said, don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. The servant looked around, and all he saw were the armies of the enemy. You guys ever feel like all you see is the enemy around you? You ever feel like situations in your life are just so overwhelming and there is no escape? So overwhelming and just despair sets in. Wherever you look, it's the enemy trying to attack, trying to get you, wherever you go. It's overwhelming. Sure, we would respond, what are we going to do? You see, when we have our human eyes eyes that only see the enemy, how could you not but be overwhelmed? How can you not but give in and be done? Yet God calls us to have different eyes. God calls us to have eyes of faith because Elisha went out and looked and he saw the army, but he saw God's army around. Because Elisha prayed in verse 17, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses, of chariots, of fire all around Elisha. God is calling us to have and look with different eyes. My wife uh, had LASIK surgery. My wife's eyes were horrible. From where she's sitting to me, she couldn't have to, you have to guess how many fingers I was holding up. And she got that done, like, f what, like five, ten years ago, somewhere between there? Yeah, somewhere between there. I was joking in the first service that as a guy, if you say between five and ten years, it's a pretty wide gap. You should, you're sure to get it, right? So I nailed that, right, honey? Five to ten years. So, guys, a little hint there. Just make it really long. Like, I don't know, ten to fifty years? Was it like that? You know, you're in there. You're safe. Anyway, a little side thing for you. <laughs> but she went from having eyes that struggled to see how many fingers I had. Is there a little bit of a difference, my love? Slight difference? Yeah. I remember one of the first mornings, she said, looking out the window, I could see individual leaves on the trees. She had never seen that before. Were you f three when you got glasses? The big Coke bottle glasses? At three, she had that. So for her life, she's never seen individual leaves on a tree, ever amazingly different eyes. And that's the kind of eyes that God would want us to look around with. For so long, maybe even starting at age three, you've had these eyes that only saw the negative, the bad, the problems, the enemy. That's all you see. Elisha had different eyes, and he prayed for his servant to have different eyes, and then he saw the chariots of fire, the army of God surrounding when you see that, sure, you're like, hey, let's go. We got this because God's with us. And I love the rest of the story. I'm not going to get into it, but I love the rest of the story because the army comes down to get him, 
And Elisha prays for God to blind them. And so they get blinded, the army. And then they're like, hey, we're looking for Elisha. Elisha's like, oh yeah, I think he's somewhere over here. Hey, come follow me and I'll bring you to where he is. Right? And so uh, it's almost like um, in Star Wars, like, this is not the George you're looking for. You know what I'm talking about in, in Star Wars? Right? So it's like, hey, this is not the prophet you're looking for. Uh, the prophet's over here. And so he leads him right to Israel's king to be, to be killed. And the, king saw, and, and the king's like, hey, should we kill him? I was like, no, no, don't kill him. Give them food and give them drink and send them off. And it says, after that, that country never fought them again. I wanted to fight them again. Hmm, I wonder why, right? But amazing story of seeing how God has a different eyes for us. Peter, when his eyes were focused on Jesus, he had different eyes. His eyes were right there with our Lord and Savior. And he was able to get out of that boat and to walk on the water. But it says the minute that he looked at the waves, he sank. Which eyes do you want to walk with? To walk by faith, we've got to have the eyes that look at our Savior. To walk by faith, we've got to have the eyes that help us to walk in him, in his power, in his strength. Peter sank. And it reminds me of, of, of me. So I told you about my personality. Being around people energizes me. And so when this pandemic hit, and we had to social distance ourselves with people, like that does not compute with me. Social distance from people? No, I need to be around people. They energize me. When I'm alone is when, I, is when like my tank depletes. No, I need to be around people. I can't do that. And then our church shut down for a few months. Well, God called me to be a pastor. That's my identity. Like I love preaching God's word. I love being around the youth. I love doing ministry. I love it. And so when all the stuff started hitting, like I started to sink. I was sinking. Not a good place. All I could see was just the pandemic and what I was not able to do. And it caused me to sink. My eyes weren't on Jesus. But then my pastor preached a message about God being omnipotent. Anybody know what that, that word means? Omnipotent. You know what it means? God is what? All-powerful. And he preached a message about God being all-powerful. And God was speaking to me. And as I was getting up at the end of the service to lead um, in the last song, we were singing What a Beautiful Name. Do you guys know that, that beautiful worship song, What a Beautiful Name? And in the third chorus, it says, What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name, the name of Jesus. And so before we sang that song, I encouraged the congregation, when we get to that part, don't just sing it to God, but sing it to your soul. Because God was telling me to sing to my soul, to remind my soul that there is power in the name of Jesus. That I don't have to look to myself. I need to stop looking at what's going around me. But I need to look to the one who can have me walk on water to walk by faith. Encouraging my soul that there is power in the name of Jesus and not to forget that. God so desires for us to walk by faith. So I want to ask you in closing, what are some areas in which you feel that your faith is a little weaker? What areas going on inside of you that you are sinking, you're stumbling, looking to give up? Because I want to encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus, to be able to walk by faith in him, in his power, in his authority. Amen? Let me pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you call us to live, to walk in you. God, you have come to give us life and life to the full. And that means to walk by faith. But Lord, we are weak. God, we stumble. And God, we put our focus on places and areas which we should not. So God, forgive us for that. Show us those areas so we can lay them down before you. Because God, we want to be walking by faith and walking in your victory. So Holy Spirit, empower us this week to walk by faith and not by sight any longer. Lord, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.